Welcome to Fort Knox. I am John Fort, live at the NASDAQ market site in New York's Times Square. And I don't even own a dog, but I am excited about today's topic because so many people do. The economy, the pet economy, is worth billions of dollars, and technology has made it easier to take really, really good care of your pets. And I mean, when I say billions, I mean in the neighborhood of $70 billion and climbing that we spend on pets every single year. And I have got just a great panel to talk today about the best ways to care for pets, the innovative ways uh, to do it, starting with Bill McFadden. Um, you might have seen his face recently in the news. He is the owner of Bold Oaks Kennels. He is an expert dog handler and breeder with 25 plus years of experience. And perhaps most important, he recently won Best in Show, or rather Bichon Frise Flynn won Best in Show at the Westminster Kettle Club, uh, and he was the handler. Also, we've got Nicholas Dodman. Uh, let me go to Aaron Easterly first. He's the CEO of Rover.com. Rover recently bought Dog Vacay. If you need to leave town and you want somebody to take good care of your dog, or if you just need a dog walker, that is becoming one of the main places to go. And then finally, Nicholas Dodman is a doctor of veterinary medicine and an animal behaviorist and best-selling author. His books include Pets on the Couch, Neurotic Dogs, Compulsive Cats, Anxious Birds, and the New Science of Animal Psychiatry. Yes, you are going to learn it all today. Thank you to all of you gentlemen for being here with me. I, I want to start off talking about the essentials for dogs and cats. And uh, Nicholas, I wanna, I wanna start with you. you. You've got like three essentials that every dog in particular needs. Rehabilitation, exercise, and an appropriate diet. And it seems to me, from what I've seen covering technology, the web, e-commerce, and mobile technology have made it easier than ever to actually supply those things to your pet. Nicholas, what are you seeing? Oh, I think that's exactly right. Um, a lot of people are moving to online sites and ordering um, food and medicines and other necessary supplies and it's almost becoming a kind of consumer based industry. It's almost like what's happening in the big stores that people are shopping online. But of course you still need a veterinarian to do physical examination but even that might drift in the direction of telemedicine in the future. It's not there yet. And uh, one of the things that, that I just think is fascinating, one of the reasons why we sought you out is you're actually kind of getting into the minds of cats and dogs, what they're really thinking, kind of the issues that they come into people's lives with. Are there ways that technology is allowing us to deal with those perhaps softer or harder to see issues that pets bring? Uh, sure, um, we've uh, used a lot of um, technology in our work. Um, you know, long story short, started looking at repetitive disorders in dogs like tail chasing. Um, That's and a disorder. It's a disorder, oh. which is now called a, um, a compulsive disorder, a canine compulsive disorder, really an obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, we've discovered genes that cause that problem, so there's a technology in there, genetics. Um, we've done MRI imaging of brains and shown that the brains of these dogs with compulsive disorder have very similar changes to the brains of people who have compulsive disorder. Um, so high tech, um, looking in great depth, discovering things, novel treatments that actually um, blend very well with the treatments for humans. So uh, a human being treated with, um, say, a drug to treat OCD, um, it would be the same medicine for dogs. And there's a great parallel. And that's kind of what I point out in the dogs, whether it's PTSD, anxiety, compulsive disorder, some kind of phobia, noise phobia, thunderstorm phobia. You know, all these things are sort of almost cookie cutter in the animals. The whole, in fact, the whole diagnostic manual of psychiatry is pretty much replicated in the, say, canine population wow. and somewhat in the feline population, with a couple of not notable exceptions. We haven't identified, um, you know, chronic uh, sort of cycling uh, conditions like bipolar, and we have yet to discover schizophrenia, if indeed it does exist in pets. Well, I, that's, that's good news. Uh, B Bill McFadden, uh, I want to go to you now. You, I guess, I, in my perhaps ignorance, I view dog breeders as, as perhaps d breeding super breeds uh, of pets that perhaps don't have these issues. But tell me, how are some of these superstars that you deal with different 
from you know the, the everyday pets that uh, most of us have around the house. I mean, is the behavior different as a handler when you're getting a dog ready to perform at the highest level? Well, every dog, they're just like people. Um, every dog has uh, its own set of, of strengths and weaknesses as far as um, just the overt showmanship. Some dogs are kind of natural. Some we have to encourage it, uh, work with them, and bring it out. Um, I, I think it's interesting. I think dogs, a lot of times, um, Nick, you're doing research with uh, personality traits and mm -hmm. habits and stuff. Dogs That's Flynn on the screen lot. there who just won the big one. Okay. Um, <laughs> dogs, a lot of times, are used with people for those same reasons. You know, there's a, a real. Uh, connection that dogs have that can calm people that have have uh, some uh, personality disorders or or emotional anxieties uh, so it's interesting to see it all kind of full circle and uh, helping each other out and there you are with Flynn ringing the bell at, at the other stock exchange fascinating so <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I wonder if there are ways you've been doing this for 25 years uh, now Bill are, are there ways that you use technology at all to, to deal with um, with these dogs who are operating at, the, at this level going to shows things like that I mean I know you don't have a huge web presence for uh, your your kettle, I, I guess in a way you're not trying to appeal to a mass audience, so maybe that's why. But do you use it at all, and and how you try to help the dogs to do better at what they do? Um, not so much at um, actually helping the dogs. I mean, like Nick said, there is a tremendous uh, uh, online marketplace now. People, all you have to do is Google. You know, like I wonder if they have booties for dogs, and you know, you you can instantly find out where to get them. Um, so for the for our owners or for us ordering food or or supplies, the technology helps. I'm not very much of a technology person, so uh, I'm still dealing just with the animal. Um, the uh, what what I've noticed in my business is is just being able to communicate with my clients because I have clients all over the country, um, some from different countries. So just being able to to uh, take a video. Uh, of a result and, and send it to an owner has made it so much more tangible for them because if they're not at the show they don't get the same experience of, of participating that they would if they were actually at the show watching. And Bill, my impression, I, I didn't realize this before, but when you win at Westminster or when a dog wins, um, it, it's not like in the prize money, it's in the stud fees. Like sometimes you can get a half a million dollars stud fee for for uh, a, a winning dog, right? I mean, you, you might get a silver no. bowl. No, not not that much. No, no, not that much. Okay, How, what, <laughs> no. what's what's the? I mean, that that sounds awesome, but no, no. It's, it's not that much. <laughs> Six no. figures, maybe stud fee. Um, that would be unusual. I, I I don't think the stud fees would increase that much. Uh, good breeders are pretty selective about who they allow to breed to their dogs, and and um, the stud fees might go up a little bit, but. Uh, not to six figures. No. Okay, so what kind of stud fees are we looking at? And is that the way that you are able to continue caring uh, for dogs at this level? Is, is it really in uh, the, the breeding and um, finding good homes for them? Uh, stud fees, generally, the rule of thumb is a uh, stud fee is about equal to the price of a, a companion animal. So if, if you're you know, paying $2,000 for a, a Chinese crested, then that's probably what a, a stud fee would be. Um, I just want to make it clear that people who breed dogs to, and show them, you don't make money breeding and showing dogs. You spend a lot of money. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not, uh, you don't win money at dog shows. There's only one dog show that has a significant amount of money that you win, and um, it's, it, it's still a drop in the bucket compared to what you spend. It's, uh, it's really a passion sport, people that do it. Um, are passionate about dogs. Um, it's a great family activity. Um, I have a lot of clients who bring their kids to shows. The kids can participate in junior handling. It's wonderful for developing social skills for kids. You know, uh, they have to learn how to deal with, with uh, winning, losing, getting along with others, 
and, and really dealing with adults. Uh, yeah. So I, I really see it um, in the junior handling, I see a lot of uh, positives for, for kids just in making the transition between um, teenager to adult. Wow. It gives them a, a good skill set. Yeah, I, I can and, imagine. Just to, yeah. just to uh, remind people, this is Fort Knox Live. I am John Fort at the NASDAQ market site in Times Square with CNBC, and we are talking about the pet economy uh, and just how huge it has become, and it continues to grow in a lot of ways. I want to talk about some of the services that are available. And just yesterday, as, as a matter of fact, I went over to the offices of Bark. They are based in Chinatown. They do, among other things, the Bark Box, which is a subscription box you can get for 25 bucks and up. Apparently, dogs really love these things. Uh, they're looking at perhaps going public, uh, doing close to a quarter billion dollars worth of sales in 2018. And I asked uh, the CEO of um, Bark when he knew that this was potentially a huge idea. Take a listen. At what point did you know that Bark had the potential to be a really big business? <laughs> I know the exact moment. Uh, so I didn't leave my job for about six months after the company started, after we started shipping boxes and getting into it. And we so were, when was that? When was the beginning? The first box was shipped in December of 2011. Okay. There were 49 shipped that month. We packed them by hand in our little conference room. Um, and How much did you charge? You remember? Twenty-five dollars a month. Okay. I remember because I was the first customer, and I'm still a customer, and that's <laughs> what I'm charged every month. Uh, but it wasn't until that April. So my my dad is a luddite. Um, to give you an example of that, that was in like I said, 2012. December of 2011, he made his first purchase on Amazon, mm. which was a book because I was standing over his shoulder walking him through it. He made this purchase in April of 2012, but he didn't know I was doing it. Mm. He stumbled across this in social media. Oh, he didn't know that it was your company? No, no. Oh. No idea. As far as he knew, I was a venture capitalist. You hadn't told him? No, no, because he'll tell me all the reasons it won't work. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so no, never brought it up, and I thought somebody was pranking me first, and said like, <laughs> "Hey, my dad showed up as a new subscriber yesterday." So you're at the point where you're still watching every new subscriber. Oh yeah, yeah. You, you dig in on everyone of like, okay, how'd they find out? Where do they live? Who is this person? Are they a friend? And I thought somebody was playing a prank on me, and it was genuine. He stumbled across this and thought it was cool and bought it, and right there was the moment I said, "This is, there's something going on here. This mm. is crazy that." Second purchase ever online. First one Amazon, fine. Second one this. So that was that was the moment for me. Aaron Easterly, CEO of Rover.com. Something tells me you know what this feels like. I mean, your company last year combined uh, with Dog Vacay. I mean, uh, the, the two companies combined, Rover plus Dog Vacay, did I believe 225 million dollars in revenue. When did you know? that this was a big, big idea. You guys are basically like a combination of Airbnb and Uber for dogs, giving them a place to stay, providing them with some exercise and somebody to walk them. When did you know that this could get huge? Well, I think when we launched our first market, which was Seattle in December of 2011, um, the fact that people were using it and we actually had dollars go through the platform and people were using it over uh, an important holiday period, uh, we knew there was a business there, but it was actually several years later where we got a sense of how big of a business it could be. Um, our business is primarily composed of people that prior to Rover was using friends, family, neighbors to watch their dog when they were out of town. So there was a question of, well, how many of those people would be willing to use Rover instead? And we didn't get a good sense of that until two, three years in. Um, it was kind of this constant debate. It's like, okay, there's a business here, but how big? And we'll do about uh, four hundred million dollars going through the platform this year. So to wow. give you a sense of uh, how big we are. Yeah, and and you've grown your network of people who are taking care of dogs. You've almost doubled it year over year. What's your process for making sure that the right kind of crazy dog person is going to be taking care of somebody's <laughs> dog? Yeah, that's that's the right question. Is the right kind of crazy dog person? 
Um, so we have a multi-step process, but we generally accept something like 10 to 15 uh, percent of applicants. For our on-demand offerings, we're probably in the single-digit percentages, low single-digit percentages. Um, there's a background check. Um, there's survey questionnaire. We look at references being submitted. Um, that goes through a technology process where we score people on a variety of dimensions. And then after that, it gets uh, reviewed by a human uh, to determine whether or not uh, we'd be proud of this person being in the marketplace. Mm. Uh, but the job never ends. We actually spend a lot of time uh, constantly reevaluating all the service providers on the platform, um, looking at the reviews, looking at the history, looking at their communications with owners, and make sure that we want to keep them on the platform as well. Um, Dr. Dodman, how, how much better is this, these kinds of services with uh, vetted caregivers for pets than what we had 10, 20 years ago when maybe there was a, a kennel in town or someplace that would board dogs or asking a friend and maybe it was a little bit more catch or catch cat. I mean, from a, from a psychological perspective, from the, from the dog or in some cases cat's perspective, those, these guys are, are, are dog guys, how much better is this? Well, it sounds like a you know, major um, step up in terms of um, finding a correct placement. Uh, of course, you do know friends and family, but then friends and family don't always ne live nearby, and they're not always um, super friend happy to you know, have the dog or <laughs> cat dumped on them for X period of time. So, you know, it is very much like a kind of an Uber arrangement, as you're saying, and that is, you know, they can um, sort of dial up and find an appropriate person who's close by, presumably, and they can drop the dog off and know they're going to get good care. So, I like the idea of it. It's like so many things that are bursting and developing in the, the dog industry now and um, you know, it's changing the subject slightly but you know say the pet wearables I understand is uh, you know cu currently like a 1.3 billion dollar industry um, now slated to kind of multiply by you know, five or ten times it's like a, a astronomical all these various um, collars you can buy with tracking your dog and speaking to your dog all the electronics and stuff like that so yeah. you know even in the um, daycare situation you could actually you know, monitor and or listen and talk to your dog. Now, what do you think about that? Because it seems like in one way, uh, dogs are a lot better than we are. Like, they're not going to get obsessed with the screens and cross the street while looking at phones. So they're, they're wearables. They, they know how to put those in the right place. But is this, is this good long-term, uh, e either health-wise or because of monitoring for our relationships with pets, for, uh, for the business of taking care of these animals? I think so. I think it's great. You know, I, my my son gave me one for um, my birthday because he just a month or so ago because he knows that I, you know, my dog used to have separation anxiety now, but the family joke is now I have separation anxiety when I'm separated from my dog. So he bought me this camera, and apparently the camera tracks my dog Rusty all around the house. It's quite expensive camera, um, but wherever he goes, the little camera eye follows him around and I can see him on my phone um, and I can hear him and I can speak to him which if nothing else when I'm sitting in a restaurant gives me some comfort oh good Rusty's sleeping and resting and then I don't get indigestion and I can have the next course <laughs> so all of these little devices I think are fantastic there's one called Pet Chats that I'm working with that company now to it's like a little TV monitor and spits out treats for your dog and you can train the dog to press the button on it and actually it rings your phone and then you can have a conversation. So it's the you know the only thing that's ever going to happen. You're sitting in a business meeting, and your phone goes. Hey, excuse me for a second. I, I just got a call from my dog. <laughs> so d does that give Rusty comfort uh, as much as it gives it to you? Like the camera following him around, your voice coming out of a camera. Like is that going to leave? Is that going to scar him, or is he okay? Oh, it won't scar him. But you know, but it, it may confuse some dogs. But you'd know that because you can see them right away. So you just choose. You know, find out how it works for your dog. It's like everything else. There's no one size fits all. But I think that's a breakthrough. And something else I'm involved in, which is a, you know, the story of my life really is um, sort of behavioral pharmacology. And I've got involved in a company. We're trying to develop, you know, medicinal uh, cannabis for pets. What? Uh, so what? it's co it's called We Can Heal. We C A double N heal ah. and we're looking for to not to go in the face of the federal government and their legislations and their uh, ridiculous uh, classification of say CBD mm. um, as a, um, a schedule one drug we're using sort of synthetics that will tweak the endocannabinoid system that will 
help with pain. And on the human side, you can say how valuable that would be to help to address the opioid epidemic if you had a, what is actually a better painkiller. Um, so all this sort of stuff, but it's a long story, but um, that's one of my interests right now, as well as trying to save pets that are going into shelters, trying to improve relationships between people and pets so there's not so much surrender that then translates into um, you know, oftentimes euthanasia of the animal. Wow. Um, I had no idea that that was a possibility um, for, for dogs and the like. Bill, I, I, I want to move on. Once again, this is Fort Knox Live. We are talking the pet economy, and I have got a great panel of guests talking to me about it. Bill McFadden, uh, McFadden is the owner of Bold Oaks Kennel in California, and uh, he was a handler for a dog that just won uh, Best in Show at Westminster. Also, Nicholas Dodman is a doctor of veterinary medicine, animal behaviorist, and a best-selling author of books, including The Dog Who Loved Too Much, Tales, Treatments, and the Psychology of Dogs. And last but not least, Aaron Easterly is the CEO of Rover.com. Um, Aaron, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll go to you. First, I'm, I'm wondering about this new trend in social media where there are some dogs who are influencers. No joke. I mean, way more followers than I have, and it's not based on winning Westminster, though that helps. But some of, some of these dogs, very cute. They'll, they'll get dressed up. They're photogenic. Um, how much does that trend influence or drive businesses like yours? Well, the first thing I'd say is uh, good for them. I think uh, most dogs out there are actually much better looking and friendlier than I am. So um, <laughs> the world is a better place by having dogs on Instagram than people like me on Instagram. Um, but in general, you know, one of the biggest trends in the pet industry is the ongoing humanization of pets. And you have two trends that come from that. The uh, uh, customization of products and services and increased desire for transparency. As people increasingly view their dogs or cats as not just family members but ac their actual children, um, you see all the same trends. Um, so instead of sending the family card at Christmas uh, with just family members, dogs are in those photos. And people mm -hmm. care just as much about raising their dog as they care about being a good human parent. Um, so uh, we expect that as an actual consequence of the trends in pets. Um, that's actually one of the bets that we placed years ago in terms of why we thought this would be an interesting industry. And uh, my intuition on it is we're in inning three of that type of uh, social transition. Mm. Um, so it'll be weird um, 10 years from now if someone has a dog that isn't searchable online, or at least doesn't have a lot of photos that can be found online, um, whereas 10 years ago it would have been odd in the opposite direction. Um, so I don't foresee that trend ending, ending anytime soon. Uh, so Bill, I want to ask you, I mean, I, I took a look, looked up Flynn on Instagram. There's a presence, but a relatively new presence. It seems to me that in your high-end care for these dogs, you're not spending a lot of time on social media. Why is that? Well, <clears throat> because technology hasn't bought me any extra hours in the week. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wish it would have, but um, we pretty much spend, uh, you know, seven days a week and, and not 24 hours a day, but, but a lot of hours a day taking care of the dogs that we're showing. Uh, my business, is, we're kind of like dog jockeys. People hire us to show their dogs, and we travel to shows every weekend. So. Uh, uh, most of our most of our work is actually hands-on with the dogs, and um, there there are technologies like I said. Uh, just shopping is is so much easier to be able to order something and have it delivered to you instead of having to so physically go out and and shop for it is uh, a good time saver. Um, but most mostly we deal one-on-one -on -one with the dogs and and with their owners, and their owners come from all walks of life. Uh, some of them are young families that have a dog and um, retirees that, you know, have waited for the day they retired to buy a motorhome and travel around the country uh, showing their dog as a vacation um, <laughs> and see the USA or Canada. So, you know, it's kind of a broad spectrum of people that we deal with. And, and a broad spectrum, uh, spectrum of dogs that we deal with. Do Dr. Dobbin, give me a, a level set here. Are there 
are there ways that we shouldn't show cats and dogs on social media or are there lines to cross this is it as simple as if kitty doesn't seem like she wants to put on those bunny ears don't put them on or you know is <laughs> is, is there a, is there a point at which kind of the instagram driven obsession of pictures with animals or pictures of animals can become not so great for the pet um, well, you know, the, the answer is in, in the individual pet as to whether they will tolerate being dressed up or whatever, and some will and some it will be an imposition. But you can do the wrong thing sometimes by choosing uh, a pet as an icon. And um, I think it's back again, but Target, you know, had a bull terrier as their sort of mascot. That's right. And uh, that would lead to, you know, people would see this dog and say, oh, how cute, because he's got the red circle around his eye, the bull's eye and they'd go out and buy them not knowing anything about the dog and then that increases the breeding and then you have um, uh, yeah, really uh, line breeding they call it but sort of inbreeding and then you have problems with the breed I mean yeah, the worst thing with uh, Dalmatians was you know 101 Dalmatians I mean that completely you know threw a wrench in that breed and so sometimes not really so much hard. the behavior of the dog itself at the time you know they either will or they won't tolerate it and probably they most of them would just be sort of indifferent it's just for our entertainment but if you show the wrong kind of dog in the wrong kind of context and you get overbreeding and certainly some dogs which are really quotes not for the novice uh, you can do uh, more harm than good well okay so so it's actually the demand for the dog in well in most cases it's a dog that actually affects the breed itself taco bell had an issue with the chihuahua too uh... if i'm not mistaken about ten fifteen years ago yeah so i believe the chihuahua is the breed that is most often surrendered in the southern part of the United States so you know they, they get them because they're cute and then find out there's some issues or I mean people don't choose dogs very sensibly um, it's sort of impulse buy they do certainly a lot more research buying their next car than they do picking up a dog it's just plain impulse they're, they're not thinking it through properly um, and sometimes it's the wrong dog for that person and they find out too late and then it gets surrendered and you know that's we're trying to work through some of that um, directly and indirectly with this group that I'm working with called the Center for Canine Behavior Studies. So we're looking at scientific studies which will help people to understand more about their pets, to understand, say, the effects of punitive training, yeah. to understand what kind of people match with what kind of treat uh, pets. And, you know, we're kind of working with a group which is like caninematch.com. Uh, it's called um, howimetmydog.com. <laughs> and they've got a wonderful algorithm that pairs um, pets with you know the right person with the right pet to save you know return and surrender wow okay um, pot for dogs and match for dogs there, there's all kinds of things that I didn't even know about now, I want to get you guys final thoughts because we're we're about to finish up and dr. Dobbin I'll, I'll start with you I understand that you have an approach to uh, dog training that's completely positive reinforcement um, no, nothing on negativity or pain. So I'd like each of you to just maybe give one tip from your base of experience that pet owners should keep in mind, maybe something that surprises people or they might not ordinarily think of. And uh, Dr. Dobbin, I'll, I'll start with you. If you had one thing to share with people that uh, a lot of people get wrong or might not know for caring for their pets, what, what would it be, advice you would give? Um, mine would be that you should not use um, uh, punitive or confrontational methods because we just published a study in um, PLOS journal plus one uh, a few days ago actually Valentine's Day and it shows once again absolutely conclusively that if you use techniques that you might see on television like alpha rolls and yelling and spanking and uh, and and using uh, collar jerking methods and stuff like that what you actually do is increase behavior problems so aggression begats aggression so I would say cut out the violence go positive wow okay and uh, Aaron Easterly what would be uh, something that you would tell people who are maybe looking for services for their dogs or something out of your experience well the first thing I'd say is that the their expenses associated with the dogs and most people when they do their back of the envelope math when thinking about getting a dog they calculate the price of food it, you know that's a small minority of the actual expenses dog owners pay we estimate uh, just shy of $3,000 will be spent on a dog in its first year, maybe about $2,000 after that. Uh, so uh, be thoughtful. Um, choose the right breed. Choose the right dog. Um, make sure you have the right uh, environment and uh, do some financial planning so you don't put yourself in a position of 
um, having to surrender um, a beloved pet. Good advice from more than pet ownership. And Bill, what would what would your advice be? Well, I, I echo that. I think uh, the most important thing is to make sure you don't buy impulsively. That if you're if you're going to get a a dog, make sure that you you do your research and find the the right dog for your environment, for your lifestyle, um, and then take good care of it. Um, I think one one thing that as far as cost of dogs or the expenses involved. Veterinary care is very expensive, mm. and, and there are um, health insurance plans for dogs that, um, you know, 15 years ago I thought it was kind of ridiculous, but now a lot of good breeders are making that a requirement that if you buy a dog for them, you have to buy the insurance because it only takes one serious problem to, to um, you know, be way, way more expensive than, than the cost of the insurance. So it's, it's something to consider when you're, when you're getting a dog. Wow, definitely. And I'm sorry, Dr. Dobbin, I, I believe you had one thing that you wanted to add? Well, I was going to say something along the same lines that, ah. uh, you know, the cost of veterinary care, I mean, one person came into me with a dog, they spent $60,000 on its skin. Another one had to have several re-ops for an abdominal problem, and that was $30,000. Um, gastric dilation, common condition, um, is $5,000, and people can't afford it. So pet insurance is one way, or you can be your own insurer, open a bank account for your pet and put twenty dollars in a month and over ten years it builds up you've now got money to deal with the catastrophe acting as your own insurer and if you don't need it you've got money left over for a nice vacation <laughs> well thank you all of you uh, gentlemen for sharing those insights certainly people can use uh, google and other search engines to do some of that research on really making sure that they're getting the right pet for them, uh, I appreciate all of you joining me. Uh, Nicholas Dodman, a professor of uh, veterinary medicine, Aaron Easterly, Rover.com CEO, and Bill McFadden, Bold Oaks Kennel Club owner, kennel owner. Um, this week on the Fort Knox podcast, I've got Matt Meeker. He is the CEO and co founder of Bark, which includes the Bark Box. You can hear his full story. He's also a co founder of Meetup, believe it or not. You know that organization that helps you meet people with similar interests. He's got quite a tale to tell, especially about startups in New York City. This has been Fort Knox Live. Thank you.